Then, of course, to break my sober October, to break my sober October, and to welcome me back to the life of um, uh, the life of excess, the life of debauchery. Of course, had to be fabric. Of course, and I decided to go to Continuum and Blueprint Records, right? And I have to be honest and say that <laughs> number one. It was an absolute nightmare to get into. Like, let's just put that out there. And I've said it before previously when it comes to fabric. Like, I like many people in London, or for many ravers, I'd say we probably all have a love hate relationship with fabric, um, just because it's like such an institution here in London or in the UK overall. But just the the infra the kind of infrastructure, yeah, maybe infrastructure is the right word. Whatever it is, the operational side around it is such a hassle to deal with, and you're a punter. It really, really, really is. And from what I've heard, it's no easier if you're a VIP. You know, you have to go in through some other door with next to a chicken shop and stuff. It's not, it's not the easiest thing. So, I went to go to a continuum and blueprint records and event. Now, for me, I was already on a bit of a, I was a bit on a, I was a bit on the how do you say it? I was a bit of a disadvantage when it came to this rave because I was working during the weekend. So I couldn't go throughout the entire event. I couldn't do the whole going there, coming back, sleeping and going out again. I had to kind of just pick my fights and go into a certain time in the morning and come back home, sleep and then go work in the morning. No big deal. I didn't have to go work as a work from home, but you know what I mean? So I couldn't stay too long and I couldn't do too much, but still it didn't matter. I went anyway. And I have to be honest, right? The fabric thing itself is such a hassle and a hellhole to deal with that I can understand why people just don't give it a chance based on just the first experience of going in there. So number one, you rock up there. And I think in general, the location for me, I think it's great. I feel like it's like legitimately feels like the center of London in a way, which is not really. But in terms of transport links, in terms of yeah taxis and cabs and, and ubers and stuff it's probably the best distance you want to get to places you want to get home so you can basically get because I've, I've done it before sometimes i've gotten a bus maybe further up and then taken a cab there and then gone home or i've taken if i'm just completely tired i'm like you know i'll take the hit i'll just take the cab all the way home but I was, or i've obviously cycled home as well on that route so it's pretty easy so it's a pretty decent place to get to and from so no hassles that regard but the issues start as soon as you rock up to the club you walk up to the club and you know there's a flipping barriers all around it and the entry system that they have is that you have to go kind of a bit further down past the door you queue up and then you kind of get screened for your ticket first of all just to make sure you got a ticket so you get screened for your ticket then you get a ticket you go through then when you go through you get screened for an id for somebody else and then they put your your id into that machine that we have in most london clubs that machine that's flipping super uh, uh, big brother-esque right it feels incredibly like 1984 flipping george orwell stuff where you basically scan your id card in it and the whole premise behind it is that it's meant to put your details on some sort of database where that database is who knows what they do with it who knows but it essentially it's meant to be like a harm prevention thing where they can share details amongst each other of other clubs in the network i don't know if they have to be local if they have to be regional i'd who knows and then they're meant to be aware of, hey, if this guy's a creep, hey, if this guy's you know, violent, if this guy's been banned, if whatever it may be, they can put those things on or maybe put other notes on there, whatever it may be. But obviously this doesn't happen most of the time because these guys, you know, they've got a million more people they have to deal with. I'm not sure if they're going to be sitting there adding notes into your box about whether or not you harass somebody at the bar, whether or not you bump somebody in a queue, who knows. So you do all that stuff and then you go into another queue where you're basically met by a two seat then you go as, then as you do that you go into into the club and you're met by two people on either side no before you do that actually so forget that before you do that you, you give a person to scan the thing and then before you walk in someone scans you with a metal detector handheld one and proper up everywhere obviously if you look like me you get scanned some more because they never know if you're on flipping you know chup 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 time so you get scanned super hard and then then you go in and then you have like two rows of people with buckets next to them and then they say to you to open all your pockets and maybe even that if you're if you're unlucky like i was you get scanned again at that station so the station where you basically put all your positions in a bucket and then you spread yourself out like that and have the person you know search everywhere and when i say search everywhere i mean search everywhere you know you're under your armpits like i i, I even had i even had the feeling that the person was searching you know that your belt loop bit 
or whatever that that position is called next to the belt that was being searched the inside of my finger was being searched the, then they used the back of their hand and searched on the inside between my legs where usually most people would stash their gear right all that kind of area it gets searched so trust me if you go to fabric just behave be your best behavior don't muck around because if they find anything on you i'm not sure what they might do to you they might put you in a flipping you know in a dust choke or something but you get searched extensively and then you get and then i got another scan again and luckily again luckily me now i'm going to clubs a lot and i've you know i've been doing this for a while and it's not something that i go to just for the sense of escapism and to go and you know get high go crazy because of that i don't necessarily go drunk and high anymore i generally maybe go in with a bit of a buzz maybe at most a bit of a flipping buzz from a magnum or something but for the most part i'm going there stone cold sober and ready to go get lit inside so luckily it doesn't affect me these things but i'd imagine if i was high off whatever and I was getting scanned and searched and groped and touched to this extent. It's the ultimate vibe killer. Ultimate vibe killer. Which is why I understand why people don't even give that place a chance. Even though the lineup is so sick. right? The lineups in Fabric every weekend, bar none, are always incredible. And nowadays even more so because they've, I felt like, opened their doors up to like more alternative quote-unquote club nights. Right? Um, some of the guys and girls involved in the LGBTQ and queer scene, some of the sex positive parties, some take place in there. So they're clearly trying to open up their horizons, you know, um, try to welcome in different people. And the fact of the matter is, if once you go there once and you hear the sound system and you hear and you see how nice the club is in terms of to get around and how it's laid out and stuff, it's hard not to go back there again. Like I've I've been there many many times over the years, and I even I have my reservations about it. I still go back because it's still legitimately on the eye and to the ear one of the best nightclubs in the world but it's just the hassle before you get in there so that finishes you put your thing in a bowl then you have to walk up some stairs to then go to the ticket office right and then the ticket office you go up and another thing that i really hate which is a, it's a pet peeve but i know there's probably good reason for it but it's the over it's the overbearing nature of the people who try to usher you along. Maybe they are ushers in terms of like, stand on that side, you're, to, you're, next, you're next. It's like, we know, we're in the queue. We can see, especially in Fabric, they've got these little, you know, they've got these little uh, ticket offices things with these perspex glasses. We're sorry, with perspex glass where the ticket attendants stand, sit in a position so they either scan your ticket or you pay for a ticket. But we can see, we know, we're standing in a queue, we see them right in front of us. But there's always somebody shouting, come on, move in front, go up, stop waiting, and you're next. And it's just, I hate that stuff. It just grinds my, grinds, my, grinds my gears. And like I said, imagine if I was high or drunk, I'd be super tense, right? So you do that, you get a ticket scanned, and then when you're finished there, you want to put your coat in a flipping coat room like I did because I had a big, massive parka that I was wearing, right? You want to put that thing in there. Guess what? You have to queue up again and then go to put your cloak, your key in the cloak, sorry, your coat in the cloakroom. So I didn't want to wait. And obviously I was with somebody else as well who didn't want to wait. And I thought, you know what? Let's just go in. Go inside. But I've got this big jacket in my hand. So now I decided to, so now I'm in a position where I have to be resourceful and find out how I'm going to maneuver this nightclub where it's incredibly hot. It's in a basement. The air conditioning is essentially non-existent raving and dancing the way that i do which is excessive and really aggressive right i kind of get with it right? i'm cramping in that dance floor i'm going for it. i'm being aggressive um i'm treating it like i'm in some sort of hardcore show you know what i mean swinging arms and elbows everywhere so now i have in a position where i'm having to start to beg for in these flipping security guards of the green room to let them let me in so i can dash my coat in the back which they were graceful enough to do they shouldn't probably done it and I probably wasn't wrong for even asking and they're probably, I hope they don't get in trouble for letting me in there, but I ended up having to dash my coat in the green room so I could have an opportunity to just enjoy myself because I didn't want to go there, pay all that money that I paid to go for a ticket just to go and hold my jacket the whole time because the queue was too long. I didn't want to keep going up and down and checking either. So that's annoying. So then I put my thing in there and then, then it starts. The actual event starts and it was heavenly. And also big up to Fabric too, credit to them because they never usually do this. I don't know why they did this this time, but for some reason, they decided to put the flipping lineup on social, and they never did this before. So they never have the set list of who's playing. Maybe because it was a continuum event in terms of going you know, from Saturday to Sunday. But either way, I super appreciate it. And the fact that we had the lineup beforehand alleviated my fears before going there in terms of who I wanted to see, in case I was going to miss anybody. That was flipping brilliant. And the rave itself, I have no complaints. I think when I arrived, um, I got to see the end of Theo Nash play I think 
I was sorry, Theo Nasser wasn't necessarily for me. And then I got obviously to see the main people I wanted to see was Dave Clark and um, Renee Wise. Number one point to make about Dave Clark. Can we just say Dave Clark? He's a very opinionated person. Somebody who, you know, doesn't uh, shirk an opportunity to share his thoughts on topics concerning DJ culture and stuff. And you can obviously see some some articles here of courtesy of Google News. Dave Clark, the scene is linked to money, not ethics. Another headline here from Dave Clark says, Dave Clark speaks out against DJs playing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Another one here where he says, Dave Clark speaks about pandemic parties. Like, clearly, right? In, uh, uh, greedy business ethics above all so somebody has got like a strong opinion when it comes to that sort of stuff and i don't know why it is but i guess in my head maybe because i've been asking myself that question the fact that i'm i would consider myself or people would class me in a role as a cultural commentator and but i also like to dj and i also would like to be in a position where i'm playing at some of these big clubs and festivals and parties and stuff i was asking myself this question recently like can you be both critic and artist or can you be artist and a critic at the same time and it's difficult to find it because you would imagine if you keep criticizing enough you might end up upsetting people who are in a position to put you in position so naturally people would kind of you know keep their thoughts and opinions themselves because they don't want it to affect their actual you know um their actual uh, artistry that they do day to day things that they want to do as a kind of job so i understand people kind of hold, hold off on it and also the other side of things, I feel like if you're somebody that's very opinionated when it comes to culture, but you also partake in it in terms of being an artist or a performer or whatever, you create things in terms of content. I always feel like sometimes the most opinionated ones usually are the ones who don't create the best work. You're focusing way too much time on what people are doing wrong and not focusing enough time on what you should be doing. And I feel that maybe a, a bit of my head a part of my head probably thought that same thing about Dave Clark. But one thing I can say for certain, one thing I can say for sure. Dave Clark is not a shit DJ. He's very, very good at DJing. Surprisingly so. Number one, when he set up into the booth after the Theo Nasser guy played, who I wasn't necessarily a fan of, he, number one, is a lot taller than he looks like on the internet. So it probably might explain why he carries himself a certain way on the internet. Like, you know, no one can talk to him, no one can chat to him. Kind of vibe, you know? And then number two, he's really good at DJing. Like, incredibly good. And from what I could hear, from what I can remember... It was mostly, I felt like, acid cuts um, that he was doing some weird effects things with on a mixer. I'm assuming maybe it was something to do with the filters, something to do with the channels. Um, but the way he was mixing, the mechanical nature of it, he was. it kind of reminded me a little bit of DVS1 in terms of his style playing behind the decks. Um, yeah, it was a lot more action-packed, a lot more... Um, there's a lot more range to it. He completely turned the dance floor up when he started performing. People started going crazy. You could tell the difference in levels when he started performing. Even though the dance floor was full when Fionnassa was playing, when Dave Clark came on, he just went a completely another level. I was near the front for the first 10, 20 minutes. And as it is in clubs, when you're not concentrating and not focusing and you're just dancing, having a good time, you don't realise how many people are coming and just like coming in front of you. And by the time I realised where I was, I was near the back again. So it's like I kind of got pushed without realising I was getting pushed. And people were going nuts. So people on the platform, on the left of me, to the right of me. This is room two, by the way. Room two is the best room for me. It's the best room. It's obviously the newest room in terms of update, in terms of what they've done with the lighting and the sound. But it's really the best room. You've got this weird kind of DJ booth that's behind this. I think it's like a concrete block, it feels like. But they've got this back bit where people can... It feels like the DJ is sort of like in um in a coliseum. That's what it feels like. They're like here, and then we're all here. There's a platform there that's above them. There's a bit behind them that's above them also. Like, we're all kind of looking down them, and they're just, like, smashing out the tunes. Oh, it's one of the best, I feel like, in my opinion. One of the flipping best. So that happened. That was a good time. Um, Dave Clark absolutely smashed it to pieces. And then, obviously, my guy, Rene Wise, came on towards the end, and I absolutely loved that. I think I stayed there for the, for the two hours that he was on. I didn't stay for the full set, but that was absolutely banging. I had to convince some people in the crowd that he was good because I think when he started, a lot of people were like, oh, he's not Dave Clark, he's not the same level. I was like, no, trust me, give this guy a chance. He, this kid's the future. He is the one. He is, he is the one. And then a few of them came back around and said, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, we like the guy. He was flicking good. But obviously, a lot of them saying, oh, he's not as good as Dave Clark. I was like, come on, man. He's not as old as Dave Clark as well. I mean, this kid is young. Like, give him some time to get used to and get, get his feet under the table. But honestly, continuing Blueprint Records, absolutely banging of a night. Like I said, I didn't get to see many more people because I had to leave because I had work in the morning. But absolutely amazing for who i did see in terms of dave clark and renee wise and i would recommend going in general but just be aware of the 
of the kind of hassle you have to kind of put up with when you're there with or to kind of get inside the club in the first place i feel like once you're in there like i said it's one of the best clubs in the world but you have to kind of get in there first and you have to hope that you don't get vibe killed because all that stuff is just annoying for me like it's just oh yeah yeah the searching is just so excessive so so much but i just i'm sure it comes from a good place i'm sure there's, there's reasons behind it you know this club nearly closed a million times due to antisocial behavior due to you know other things going on inside that we don't need to mention and the fact that they're still around says everything about them the fact that they take it seriously they do and the fact also let's give them credit that they're pivoting you know they're an institution that could be stuck in their own ways and just booking flipping clones of ricardo villalobos playing every single day craig was just playing every single weekend they could just do the same or same one and it would still probably do pretty well because they got a crowd and they've got a community of people that love that space regardless but the fact that they're trying to reinvent themselves without selling out what they actually are about is not selling out but without kind of you know removing themselves from what made them who they are is really admirable and i feel like doesn't get enough credit because a lot of places wouldn't probably do that so big up to them even though maybe it's the market dictating it whoever um it's just the, the the hassle of getting in is just too much it's just too much it really is too much um so you really have to love who you're going to see in order to kind of put up with all that but i did i enjoyed it room two was smashing i didn't really see anyone in room one didn't really care for the most part and bigger fabric also for putting out the set list beforehand because that was really really welcomed